This morning, as we, uh, as we dig in, we're going to be wrapping up this baggage series, and we've talked about all the different kinds of stuff that we carry in our baggage. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the kind of thing that, that we carry in our baggage that connects us to be a fruitful kind of people. You know, there are a lot of popular television shows on television, and, and of course, I hear different ones of you speak of the shows you watch, like The Voice or Dancing with the Stars or, or whatever else, you know. I, I, I tend to go with the extreme makeover kinds of things, you know. I, I like to see, you know, what happens from beginning to end, like Biggest Loser. That always amazes me to see how people go through that kind of a transformation over, and I, I keep saying, why don't I do one for pastors or something, you know, a complete makeover like that. But, you know, I I look at that, and and the reason I think that that oftentimes we'll get carried away with those kinds of shows is because it gives us all a little bit of hope. You know, if you're watching Yard Crashers, which I I hang out at Lowe's during the week just seeing if the guys will come by, you know, it gives you hope that I could do this with my yard. Or if uh, you're watching Extreme Home Makeover, it gives you hope about what maybe you could do with your kitchen or or, you know, um, whatever else it may be. We like those things that, that give us hope. And so hope becomes a, a very important reality in every single one of our lives. And, um, you know, when we talk about hope and, and all, that's what Christ gives us. And then he gives us something else that's very, very important. He Not only does he bring the hope that comes into our lives when we trust him as Savior and Lord, but he produces something within us through the presence of his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote about that in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22, in which he said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such as these nine things, there is no law. You know, how many of you could be a little bit more loving? Only a few? How many of you could experience just a little bit more peace in your chaotic life? Or a little bit more joy? How many of you men need self-control? Ladies, when you're shopping. Gentleness. Kids, how many of your parents could be a little bit more gentle? You know, we talk about all these different kinds of things. And, and you know, it would, it would be an awesome deal to be able to say, man, I've got all nine of these things down. And the fact of the matter is, according to the Scripture, we ought to have all nine of these things down. The, 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 the fruit of the Spirit is different from the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit enables us to do the things that God has specifically given us to do. But the fruit of the Spirit is the product of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit living in us and living through us. And they become the very characteristics of Jesus' personality shining in your life and shining in my life. But here we are, we're wrapping up a series on baggage. It's Memorial Day weekend. It's a weekend in which we remember those who have fallen to give us freedom on a national level. And it doesn't just, you know, pertain to this century. It goes all the way back to the beginning years of this country. And we're thankful for that. And we're grateful to God that he's given us a freedom because Jesus came and lived and died and rose again on our behalf. But the other side of the Memorial Day weekend is kind of like the unofficial kickoff to to the officialness of summer. As a matter of fact, for those of us that live here, we were suddenly brought to a halt on the highways on Thursday. Suddenly there were lines at the supermarket. Suddenly when we went out to dinner, they were telling us it's a 45 minute wait and we've not waited all winter long. Wow! You summer folks have gotten here. How many of you are here for, the, you know, for a week or a weekend or, or whatever else? And, and all, we're glad you're here. It's an awesome place to live. You ought to come by real estate. We enjoy living here and we enjoy seeing all the different people. But one of the things that we do, whether we live here or whether we vacation here, you know, it's kind of like going to the beach. And, and you know, when you go to the beach, you always need a, a good beach chair, Right? And so I grabbed this one out of one of my boys' trucks because I thought I'd sit down in a comfortable chair like you this morning. 
And, you know, I just thought, you know, I got all this light bearing down on me. It's kind of like being out on the beach, right? And when you go to the beach, you know, I'm always getting a little thirsty. So I've got water in my backpack. You know, because you always need a little something to, to quench your thirst, get your tongue wet again. Oh, that's good. I wish you could have some. But I'm not that loving. And I'm not that self-sacrificing. And so, because I'm not that much, what I need is the love of Christ floating through me. But you wouldn't want to drink after me anyway. I might have cooties. But you know, in your backpack, there's other things you carry. And, um, you know, one of the things I didn't bring today was, was uh, I did not bring sunscreen because men don't sunburn. You know, don't y'all know that? And... Um, can't find my way in, but I got my magazines. Man, I've got a cool one right here. I've got my four-wheel drive catalog. I can look and I can dream about, I can have hope about, man, all the stuff I could do to my Jeep, you know, to make it tougher looking, to make it meaner. You know, Jeeps don't get there fast, they just get there. And, uh, but they're fun to drive and, and I like, uh, but not every day. But I like to think about, man, that's, that's a pretty good looking Jeep there on the front. You know, it's got those big fat tires on it and all that good stuff that cuts down on gas mileage and gives you a little rough and loud ride, but you look good doing it. And so I sit there and I, I'm kind of enjoying those kinds of things. And something else I find that I need along the way is on any good beach day, one of the things I need is I need snacks. So I brought a little bag of Skittles along with me. You know, Skittles are fruitful, right? And for those of you who, um, who got a bulletin, you got a bag of Skittles. The rest of you we ran out of, and so I'm sorry. But, you know, maybe God can work in my life in such a way. But, you know, the, these Skittles are fruit flavored. As a matter of fact, one of the brand new flavors they got is green apple. Man, I'm so glad they got green apple. I just wish they'd put more red ones in the bag. I like the red Skittles the best out of all of them, then the purple ones, and then I'll get down to the greens and the yellows, you know. So it's red, purple, orange, then green, then yellow, something like that. But, you know, I'm, as, a, as a believer in Christ, as one who has Christ living in me and his spirit lives in me so as to produce fruit, my life ought to be producing and exhibiting these kinds of things in my life anyway, a sweetness to the fruit that is loving and peaceful and gentle and self-sacrificing. And so the Lord has given me these things that I might live for him and that I might live for his glory. So really what I need to do with my fruit, rather than hoarding it, is I need to take my fruit and I really need to put it on display for everybody to see. Man, now that's a jar of Skittles, is it not? Now, who didn't, who didn't get any Skittles? Who, who got in here too late to get a bulletin? Anybody? Here's a hand right here. You want a Skittle? Go ahead, reach in my jar and have a Skittle. You can have two or three if you'd like, or you can get a whole handful. It'll help you through the message. <laughs> there you go. And so with my Skittles, here's what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be that kind of a person who shares, who shares that life, and I share that life because Jesus lives in me. And this morning, as we wrap up on baggage, you know, we've been talking about the what, what's in our bag. And this morning, what I want to do is I want to be able to bring the what together with the how. Now, the what's in our bag is the Spirit lives within us. And because the Spirit lives within us, we ought to be a people that bear fruit. And the how is how do I bear fruit? How do I do that? How do I accomplish that? Well, the Lord Jesus gives me some very specific instructions in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. He says in that passage of Scripture, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you, for no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you, uh, can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine and you're the branches. And if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know, Jesus right here is talking about a, a, a principle that we call synergy. It's when two uh, elements come together to produce uh, a great and desired effect. And it comes from the uh, Greek word synergia or synergos, which means working together. So Jesus and his spirit works together with you and with me to produce a spiritual fruit in our lives, which is a fragrant and sweet aroma. As a matter of fact, you know, if I sit here and sniff those Skittles, I can smell them and it smells like a lot of good tasty stuff, you know, that I would really, really enjoy, that you could really, really enjoy. And, and so that's the way my life's supposed to be. Now, what's important right here is Jesus spoke these words on the night before he was crucified. He spoke them to his disciples, knowing that he was about to die and go to the grave, rise again, spend 40 days among them, ascend in the glory with the promise that he is coming back. And what the Lord Jesus Christ attempted to do and wanted to do is he wanted us to be empowered as believers to demonstrate nine essential characteristic personality traits in our lives that are essentially a reflection of him. And so when we talk about that, I want to share with you four truths pertaining to that. And the first truth is this, the proof is in the fruit. The proof is in the fruit. Now, when you go to the grocery store, and, and you buy fruit, you know, some of it's rather obvious, is it not? I mean, a banana looks like a banana. And an um, apple looks like an apple, whether it be red or yellow or green. And a watermelon, you know, looks like a watermelon. It doesn't look like a cantaloupe. But occasionally you get into the produce department and you, you, uh, you choose something that's a little bit funky, maybe like a, a mango or a pomegranate or, or something like that. And when you go to check out, that person on the checkout is very dependent on that sticker that is on there to tell them how much to charge you for it, correct? So they know exactly what it's going to be. Or sometimes, you know, like my wife will send me to the grocery store and give me this list of stuff for some special recipe she's doing, and I don't know what some of those things are. And so I'm in the produce department, and I'm reading those little tags to make sure I, I get the right thing. Well, for the Christian... As we live our lives before God and as we live our lives before one another, the Lord Jesus Christ said, by their fruit, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, you can look at some people and say, man, they're working hard, man, they're always there. Man, they dress the best of anybody for church. But that's not how the Lord Jesus says that, that we're to be recognized. We're to be recognized by our fruit. God's plan for you in your life is not that you're to be the best dressed or the most overworked or anything like that. But God's plan and God's best for your life is that you would be the most fruitful. He wants you to bear fruit. On a second level, he wants you to bear more fruit. And on a third level, he wants you to produce much fruit within your heart and within your life. And so the, the fruit of a Christian life is love and joy and peace. Those kinds of things, those nine things against which things there are no law. That is the proof that's in the fruit. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse number 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so, you know, Christian fruit can be expressed in a, in a couple of ways. In one sense, you know, the, the fruit of a Christian life is another Christian. In other words, you know, we are in the business of spiritual reproduction. We share our witness with somebody who comes to know Jesus Christ, and, and they in turn share their witness with someone who comes to know Jesus Christ. That's spiritual reproduction. It's just like an apple. You slice open an apple, it's got seeds within it. Why are those seeds there? because that apple, although it's fruitful, it is seeking to be reproductive. And so, you know, the proof is in the fruit, and, and as we are fruitful, we're going to multiply. One way that we multiply is through that process of leading other people to that relationship with, with Christ. You know, this church exists because people have uh, existed for that, and they've shared the Lord Jesus Christ with other, uh, with other people. And, and secondly, the fruit, what it describes are these nine characteristics in, in, in the text of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. 
And, and, and you know, so, you know, some people, you know, they can look at the leaves of a tree and they can identify what kind of a tree it is. They can look at its bark and identify what kind of, of, of a tree it is. But, you know, for, for people like me, it needs to be something like fruit. Oh, that's an orange tree or that's a lemon tree or that's a pear tree or that's an apple tree or, or whatever it may be. And so the Lord said, you know, we will be known by our fruit. The proof is in the fruit. But there's a problem that happens. Sometimes our, our fruit trees are diseased. Sometimes, you know, our, our lives are diseased and they're not producing fruit. Paul wrote to the Galatians once again in chapter 5 and verse number 17. He said, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. Who can give an amen on that? Your sinful nature... You know, that that you ought not to be doing, that that tears you down, that that separates you. You know, it's always contrary. It's always in conflict to that which I ought to do, right? Is that, can you identify with that? You know, you always go with that. So it's always in that kind of a conflict, and your spirit's in contrary to your sinful nature. So they're in conflict with one another so that you do not do what you want. So if you're not being productive in the, spru in the fruit department, there's one of two problems that are happening right there. The first problem could be is that the Spirit of God is not in you. Now, if the Spirit of God is not in you, this is simply what it means. It means that you've never come to a place in your life where you've turned from your sin, where you've turned from yourself, when you've turned from your self-reliance, and you turn to God in Jesus Christ. That's called repentance. And you said, God, I need you in my life. I need the Lord Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I need your spirit to live within me in order that I might not only be saved, but that I might be always guided by you. And so the Spirit of God is not going to live in a person who's never turned to Christ and trusted Christ and, and looked to Christ for his mercy. But a second problem that can prevent us from having the Spirit of God producing fruit in us is as believers. There is that conflict that's going on. And the sinful nature is being allowed to rise up and, and to take charge. And it's not being put down on a regular kind of a basis. You know, we've received, we've believed, but there's that conflict going on. And, and we have this tendency to slide away from God. Every one of us do. You know, we're going along and we're doing fine. And Lord, we're praising Jesus we're jumping up and down for Jesus. We've got the chills up and down our spine for Jesus. We're feeding hungry people for Jesus. We're clothing naked people for Jesus. But we tend to slide away because it's not the things that we're doing for Jesus that keeps us close. It's the things that Jesus is doing with us. It's what he's producing within us. And we have that tendency to slide away. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, a couple of pieces of the utensils there in that tabernacle were meat hooks. And those meat hooks were to keep the sacrifice in the middle of the sacrificial table because they always had that tendency to slide away. It's not that you want to, but you just do. You quit reading the Word as much as you were reading the Word. You stop praying as much as you were praying. You stop attending worship with other believers as much as you were attending worship with other believers in the corporate body and start thinking, man, I can do it on my own or, or I've got this thing to go to or that thing to go to and all these things pull us away and before we know it, we've slidden off the altar. Paul wrote to the Galatians again in chapter 5, verse 19. He said, when, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, this is what happens. Your lives will produce these evil results, sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness of lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, divisiveness, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. You know, that's exactly what happens. You know, I may not have all those things exhibited in my life, but you know what happens? I know that when I have an outburst of anger, that I've slipped. I mean, that's a warning sign. I know that if I get divisive, that's a warning sign. I know that if everybody else is wrong and I'm right, which I oftentimes think, can you identify with that? I need to check 
There needs to be a check in my spirit. There needs to be a check about what's going on because there's a possibility that I've got a problem that's going to prevent me from being spiritually productive in my life. And so what needs to happen when that happens is I need the Lord Jesus Christ. I need the Father who's the master gardener to come along and take out his snippers and snip off those unproductive branches in my life. So I'm glad that God has a plan for that. As a matter of fact, Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your nature. So how do I do that? I told you this is about the how, right? If proof's in the fruit, but I've got a problem with my fruit, here's the how to get that fruit looking right. And it's just an ABC approach. Number A is this. It's going to be act. Act as if God has given me these gifts. Why? Because if the Spirit of God is living within you, all nine of these things are there. Now, they may not be evident, but you begin to act. When you feel that moment of, of uh, outburst of anger coming on, you say, wait a minute, I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to choose gentleness. So I begin to act as if God has already begun that work within me. And so what that means then is that through this life that I have with the Lord God, you know, that he has a power to, be, to produce love in my life where I've never felt love before. He has a power to bring into my life in the midst of all this chaos and stuff, a joy that I had been missing. What this means in this fast-paced American hectic life with to-do lists and pressures of the world that I I live in, you know, and, and all, is that God can place within me a sense of peace that surpasses understanding, and he can give me a joy unspeakable and full of glory. So that's the act. And B is I believe that God is the only one who can give me that kind of a makeover. That he's the only one that can do it. You know, because if I don't believe that, that God's the only source of, of a true makeover, then all the A is is an act. I can't act that way for long. It's not going to, to be real. As a matter of fact, Satan, he can replicate every spiritual gift that's out there. He can replicate them all. But the one thing he can't replicate is the fruit of the Spirit. He can't do that. And so if I'm just acting, it's going to show pretty quick. But I've got to, I've got to be, I've got to believe that God is the one who brings this into my heart, who brings this into my life, and who makes it happen. And then I've got to choose God, see, at every encounter. You know, when, when I'm faced with a decision, that moment-by-moment -moment decision in life, do I go to the right or do I go to the left? I've got to choose God at every opportunity to make a decision. So the proof is in the fruit. There's a problem that exists, but God has a plan to get me out and to get me productive. Number two then is I can't produce fruit, but I can bear fruit. I can't produce fruit, but I can bear fruit. You know, there's a difference between being a producer of fruit and bearing fruit. A branch just shows off the fruit that the vine has produced that is brought into, its, uh, into the branch, you know. And, and Jesus said in John 15, 4, he said, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, the biggest mistake that you and I can make about the fruit of the Spirit is to think, that we can manufacture love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You know, fruit cannot be manufactured. You will never see a fruit factory. Now, you may see a, a manufacturing factory that, uh, that bu builds cars or, or that, that makes chairs or that makes ovens or that makes appliances or that makes motorcycles or, or whatever else, but you will never see a, a, a factory that makes and produces fruit. It just does not happen. And, and, and so you can, you know, you can't manufacture, you know, spiritual fruit either. Just like for physical fruit, there's got to be the proper mix of water and sun and soil. With spiritual fruit, it comes supernaturally and, and where there's a proper mix of the life of the Son of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the willingness of myself. I read about a village leader some years ago who had never 
been around electricity. You know, it's hard for us to imagine that, isn't it? Because we live with electricity, but I've been in, you know, several third world countries and sometimes out in the mountains and out in the villages, there's no such thing as electricity. And this uh, villager was quite amazed with it. You know, somebody had brought him over here to this country and he saw these round balls with, uh, of glass that produced light and he saw a wire here and he saw a plastic switch and he bought all that stuff to take it back to his village. His friends asked him, you know, what's all this strange stuff, these glass balls and this wire and, you know, these plastic things? What's that for? He said, just wait till tonight and you'll see. Man, he took that wire and he wrapped it around the light bulbs and he hung them. And he wrapped another end around the, the plastic switch. And he invited all of his friends and said, look at this. And he turned that switch and nothing happened. You see, the problem was that switch was not connected to the source of power. And in the very same way, listen, in our lives as Christians, unless we're connected to the source of power, the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're just going to be like a dead switch. We're going to be like that thing that produces no thing. We're going to be useless. And, and the Lord says that He is going to cut that kind of stuff off. You know, that's not going to, to stay. And, and, and so, you know, when, when we begin to think about that, you know, our responsibility is not to, is not to be uh, in the place where we produce fruit. Our responsibility is to, to be available to God to hang His fruit on us, the branch. So the proof is in the fruit. I cannot produce fruit. I only exhibit the fruit that God produces. And number three, Prune branches produce more fruit. You may be thinking, well, how can I be more fruitful in my life? Jesus says in John 15 too, he says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. There are three levels of fruit bearing. Bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, and bearing much fruit. And there's only one way that a vine can produce more fruit, and that's through the process of pruning. Now, I've got to remember, Jesus is the vine, and the Father is the master gardener in this scenario. But it would make sense to me that the Holy Spirit would be the sap that, through which the, the life-giving flow comes to the branches. And so, you know, imagine you get to a place in your Christian life, man, these nine things, you've got love, you've got joy, you've got peace, you've got kindness, you've got tenderness and gentleness and self-control and all this kind of stuff, you know, just oozing out of you. You know, you'd think you'd get a medal or some kind of a pin or something for that, wouldn't you? I mean, think about it. You know, some of you, you know, you remember back now, most of the, if you're under probably 50 in the crowd, you wouldn't remember this, but over 50, you remember they used to give these perfect attendance pins to you for going to church, right? And, and I remember as a kid, you know, people having these pins that attached to one another, and they were... You know, they were getting long on these folks. They had 50, 60, 70 years perfect attendance. Man, I thought they were super Christians. And you know, about the time you start thinking you're a super Christian, all this stuff is oozing out of you, the master gardener comes along and he looks at our life and this is what he sees. He sees spots in our life that are not quite as productive as they ought to be. They might be bearing more fruit, but he knows that spot can be producing much fruit. Or there might be a point in our life that it's not very fruitful and, and he wants us to be fruit producing. And so he comes along and he pulls out his divine snippers and, 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 and he begins to prune. And you know, this is what I found in, in my life is I found out that pruning is painful. And I found out that as a pastor, as God has pruned his church, that pruning is painful. And I found out as a husband and as a father and as a grandfather in our family that, that pruning is painful. I don't come before the Lord in the morning and say, oh God, I exalt you this day. Please prune my life. I don't do that. Because this is what I know. Pruning is painful. That call in the middle of the night 
can oftentimes be a call that brings a, a sheer cut of pruning that pushes you in such a ways to be so totally dependent upon God that you didn't know you couldn't be that totally dependent upon God. But God will produce in your heart and in your spirit a peace that surpasses understanding. Sometimes in the chaos, God is speaking. He's given his presence. And when your old sinful self is wanting to have that outburst of anger, and you're wanting to give a tongue lashing, and you want to tell this person what a despicable piece of a Christian, if they are a Christian, that they are. God snips, and he produces a gentleness that's unexplicable. Pruning's painful. You know, he starts the pruning process, and we say, oh God, not that. I mean, pruning is counterintuitive to us. You know, we, we plant an apple tree, and it's growing, and it's looking good, but it's not being all that productive, and, and we don't think we want to prune it. Man, that's going to hurt it. I've read that if you go and look at apple trees in Israel, it produces some of the finest apples in all the world. There's scars and there's marks all over those trees from the pruning that, have happened, that has happened. And as I look across this congregation, I see people that have been through pruning in their lives. It's not always an outward thing that you see. Sometimes it's somewhat covered up, but God uses those moments of pruning that we might be ministers to others that are going through things like that. You know, the last seven years or so have been, you know, some difficult years for many people. Some people have lost jobs and homes and some have lost lives and some have lost family. It's been hard. But yet in that process, for those that have said, okay, God, this is what you're allowing to be cut out of my life and this is what you're pouring into my life. I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. What's God done? But his spirit has flowed in you and has produced life in you and has produced fruit in you. And you've become a more pleasant you than you ever were before. You've become the kind of person that exhibit the fruit of the spirit so that when people come around you, they want some of you. And they feel welcomed by you to just reach in the dish and to pull out a piece of fruit and to enjoy that and to enjoy your presence because in some way you reflect the characteristic personalities of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, this is what's important. If I'm going to be fruitful in my life, I've got to stay connected. I've got to stay connected to Jesus. Because when I'm disconnected, I'm not fruitful. When I'm disconnected, I'm, I'm not productive. So my main thing is to remain closely and tightly connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when I go through those times of pruning, you know, it can be tough. Like the Apostle Paul. Y'all remember the Apostle Paul, his name in Greek. Would you believe this? Because some people have even suggested this is what his thorn in the flesh was. Anybody want to take a guess? Paul, Paulus. You know what it means? Little one. What man wants to be called little one? Right? Guys, can you identify with me on that? You know, we don't want to be referred to as the, the little one. You know, we, we want to be the linebacker. We want to be that force to be dealt with. But the Apostle Paul, he knew what that pruning was all about. And he says in 2 Corinthians, he says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day on the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from fall 
faults, uh, brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. And I've been cold and I've been naked. How many of you want to be powerful and fruitful like the Apostle Paul? That's what it's going to take. So how did Paul become productive through all that he had been pruned through? He held tightly. He held tightly to Jesus. You know, as we kick off the summer, wrapping up a school year, some of you have already gotten out of school. Some of you still have a week and a half of school to go. I don't know about you, but as a parent, I'm ready for school to be done with for the, for the summer. You know, I'm tired of the schedules and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. But you need a break. And some of you need breaks too from, from work. And therefore, you're on vacation or you're planning a vacation. Some of you need to just sit back and relax in the beach chair and see what God might do and see what God might speak and th flip through your catalog and look at the possibilities and think, wow, I could do that. But then we come to a place in that relaxation where we recognize, well, the very things that I need to do in my life or that need to happen in my life, I'm incapable of doing. And so in my backpack, oftentimes, when I go to the beach, I carry one other item. And I dig through, and my other item is a Bible. And I open up the Word of God. I'm just going to read, kind of like where it fell open. And I read in Psalm 1, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, Get this, which yields its fruit in its season. Which yields its fruit in its season. Which yields its fruit in its season. God, I need to be a fruit-yielding tree because I'm connected to you. I wonder for how many of us we could pray that kind of a prayer. I mean, it'd be personal and individual. Because I've had the outburst of anger. I've had the selfish desire. I've had the lustful thought. I've had the immorality. But aren't you grateful that with God there are no outcasts? That with God, there's no orphans. That He takes us right where we are. And what He does in our life when we yield to Him is He brings about the glorification of Himself. So that we can respond to God and say, God, in my life, I desire that you be glorified. I desire to be the kind of man, the kind of woman that's planted firmly in you and that all of my strength comes from you and as your spirit flows through me that, that your fruit be made manifest in me. Lord, that I'm an aroma to others. And I touch other lives where they may have never been touched and I share love with people Some of them never feeling love before. Lord, help me to love the orphan. Help me to love the outcast. Maybe you're in a place in your life and there's no fruit whatsoever. 
And the big thing here is, is getting connected to the vine. How do you do that? You simply ask God. You know, there's not a prescription for how to pray, but this is what God says. He said, turn to me and call on my name and you'll be saved. To turn means that I'm going to quit living for myself and I'm going to live for God alone. To call upon his name says, God, I need your help. So you can pray that prayer out in any way that you want to, but you make it public. You make it public. Just like the baptismal folks did this morning at both services, they made it public what Christ had done in their hearts in private. And you follow after Jesus. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray for you. And after that, we're going to sing a song of response in which you can step out and you can say, Pastor, I'm praying for Jesus to come into my life and I'm turning from my old ways. Or, Pastor, I'm coming to be a part of this church family. Or, Pastor, I want to be baptized. Or, Pastor, would you pray for me that I can be a more fruitful Christian? I want God to do a work in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious, glorious day that you've given to us. A day in which your Son has risen once again. A day on which the rain falls on the earth. A day on which the vine continues to grow. Lord, help us, first of all, to be connected to the vine. I pray for people right now that are responding to you. That are responding to your touch of grace in their life to bring them to faith in Christ Jesus. That you would do your work and they would be open and willing. Lord, I pray for Christians today that are seeking to be more fruitful and more productive. Lord, they don't want to settle with just being fruit-bearing. They don't want just more fruit. They want to be a much fruit kind of person. Father, I ask you to help us reach that level. Father, in your church be glorified. In our lives be glorified. And Lord, help us to bring a tremendous basket of fruit before the throne of glory when we meet you for eternity one day. Because we've grown in you and we've trusted you. And we've given you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand together and let's sing. You come right now. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire. And I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee.